so okay yeah. uh, thanks for the introduction artur so uh, apparently i'm giving a talk on sending an aluminum box to orbit using open source so that's what comes to my mind first when i think of an aluminum box but since we are at a cubesat workshop it has to be a, a cubesat <laughs> little bit about me uh, as artur has already mentioned i'm from Billa Institute of Technology and Science or bits for short a lot of uh, electronics in the name itself that's the logo of my college i interned at the indian space research organization this summer i worked on satellite uh, dynamics and control and did something with a kalman filter so i started with open source in my freshman year my first experience was with this library called gdal it is by uh, a company not a company an organization called OSG i think a lot of you must have heard of it so i use gdal because we are supposed to deal with hyperspectral images and gdal was the first library open source that i could find to uh, read in hyperspectral images and then process them i later moved on to open chemistry because i wanted to see what i could do with open source with my other major which is in chemistry so i worked with a software called avogadro uh which you can see visualize molecules of thousands of atoms which is mostly proteins so why am i giving this talk in the first place it's because uh, i want to present what we are doing in my team which is called team anand uh it's the first hyperspectral imaging nano satellite in india and it's a big challenge to put in a hyperspectral imager on a nano satellite it's been done on bigger satellites but on a nano satellite it, uh, on nano satellite it's a completely different story so for those of you who do not know what a hyperspectral image is this is what it looks like in pals color so for a normal image you have r g and b bands red green and blue is that right so for the human image uh, i to see it you just have um, you just take a photo in the red green and blue bands and then you put them together you see what what you get is what you see in hyperspectral Im uh, image you take a photo in hundreds or thousands of uh, spectra so for our satellite in, in this case would be you start at 400 nanometers go up to 1000 nanometers but you take an image at every 5 nanometers so you go like 400 405 410 and so on until 1000 nanometers uh, which comes up to around 120 bands for our case Uh, some specifications about our satellite is a 3 unit cubesat and it weighs 2.84 kgs at the moment it might change later on as we keep on adding more adding or uh, removing more components <coughs> so this is what our satellite looks like it's just a, a simulation model we are a team of 40 undergraduates only we do not have any post graduates uh, we do have a lot of mentorship from our teachers and from the indian space research organization but the work is mostly done by us undergraduates here's the team with what appears to be a saturn 5 rockets model and that's me in the middle so why are we doing a hyperspectral imager it has a lot of applications but uh, the main one for us would be carbon dioxide monitoring the image that you see here is of a phytoplankton bloom somewhere towards the south of iceland and it looks pretty beautiful the 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 phytoplankton bloom is directly proportional to the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so using this using a hyperspectral imager you find out how many phytoplankton are there in an area and you can tell how much carbon dioxide is there in the atmosphere um okay about the timeline of our satellite we started somewhere around here in 2013 and that's when we designed uh, tried out our first antenna we've come a long way from there to till here right now which is the preliminary design review the plin the pdr is a stage set by the indian space agency wherein we send them a document they'll tell us what's wrong with it and it's an iterative process so we keep sending them again and again and they keep telling us what's wrong with it and by now we're in the third iteration of it it can never get uh, correct in the first try right So yeah this is the first ground station we're talking about in 2014 around as you can see it's not much but we did get this image from a satellite so it seemed pretty cool to us at the time Finally what has this got to do with open source 
open source is very important for our uh, satellite because we do not want to uh, use existing frameworks just like that. We decided to become more of a research team, a research-based team, so that we can correlate whatever we uh, do in this satellite with what we learn in our academics. And I talk about academics because our team is mostly made of people from uh, electronics uh, engineering, which uh, is my major as well. So the subjects that are common uh, with what we do here is microprocessors, computer architecture, and my favorite, microelectronics. So if anyone is interested in microelectronics and open source and space, uh, I'd love to meet them after the talk. Now how do we correlate these subjects to what we learn in the satellite? For me, the biggest uh, case of this was our, uh, the board on which we are testing the whole onboard computer, which is a Z board. This is manufactured by Xilinx, and it contains a Zinc 7000 system on chip. The system on chip is made of ARM Cortex A9 processing system and an FPGA, which we also call as programmable logic, which is a PL. Um, this is all very complicated, so it doesn't matter. This is what I want to focus on. This is the program, uh, the PS and the PL, the, the ARM Cortex A9 and the FPGA on this system on chip. All of this is a lot of these things we use, such as GPIOs or an SD card to boot it up <coughs> and all. So my favorite part of this is that it runs Peta Linux. Peta Linux is designed by Xilinx itself. It is the open source operating system that we are using here. And uh, we also run the ADCS algorithms on this board itself. So the ADCS does not have their own uh, microprocessor. And the FPGA, you might be wondering why we have an FPGA in the first place. Why didn't I go for just a Raspberry Pi? And that is because the hyperspectral imaging is a very intensive, uh, sorry, the compression is a very power intensive uh, process. So we decided to go for an FPGA so that we could have uh, hardware optimizations as well. The algorithm that we're using for compression is the CCSDS lossless multispectral and hyperspectral image compression algorithm. And uh, Yep, so the operating system I've already mentioned is Peta Linux. And this helps me to understand computers at the lowest possible level, uh, right at the abstraction between hardware and the software. Uh, so that is how open source is helping me out to understand uh, what I learn in my academics. All right, so we are designing device drivers for the custom low-level actions. There are a lot of device drivers available in the Linux kernel as it is. So we decided to code our own because, uh, because we wanted some custom actions to be done by the driver whenever, let's say, an interrupt comes from the programmable logic or some sensor. We are also dealing with file systems because uh, it is a task for us to store the compressed image in a SD card, but then another microprocessor from the telemetry is supposed to read that the telemetry does not have an operating system, so it cannot understand the file system if, if you use a default file system. So we are supposed to design a file system of our own in such a way that the telemetry's microprocessor can understand it. And the flight plan, which is uh, the, 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 the topmost process of our satellite, is also written in C uh, in this uh, kernel. So here's the startup process. Um, the OBC boots are startup. This happens when, when the EPS starts the OBC in the first place. And then the startup sequence is coded in, uh, in C. And then we spawn multiple processes relating to a lot of modes. Th this is how we design our, uh, our software. We have a lot of modes of the satellite. And depending on the conditions, your satellite can be in any of the modes. So it will majorly be in the idle mode. But then let's say you want more power, you want to point towards the sun. So you have the sun pointing mode. The compressing of image mode is the one that takes up the most power. And then we have uh, the other modes as well, uplink, taking picture, and all. This is how the software abstraction layer is available. The topmost is the flight plan, which will spawn a lot of processes as required by the mode. And then this is where the device drivers are and further down, you get to the hardware. So what about the rest of the satellite? This was just the software. So this is our antenna that we have assembled and used in the past around six months. This is a Helmholtz cage. 
we had to simulate what the magnetic field of uh, the the magnetic field will be when viewed by the satellite in orbit. So one of us designed an orbit propagator. It it models the magnetic field uh, in Earth's orbit, and this is what the cage does. According to the uh, according to the model, it will create a magnetic field because current is passed through these uh, bars, and it creates a magnetic field simulating what it would be in the Earth's orbit. Yeah. So. Just one last side note on Arduino. Arduino is used everywhere, so I need not uh, elaborate on that. But it's just that it's a very handy tool, and we've used it for the hardware in-loop simulation of that same uh, magnetometer testing that I just mentioned. And Arduino is used for generating interrupts to our Z board. I am right now working on interrupts on the Z board, so I have to create a device driver to handle those interrupts. And finally, to simulate any device in a generic manner. Yeah, that's the end of my talk. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, so w one of the <laughs> one of the issues with using FPGAs in small satellites is the power consumption. Yep. How do you tackle that? What's your power budget? So just, <laughs> just the power from the sun is not enough. You need batteries for that. So we have four batteries, two in, pa uh, two in parallel and then two again in series. Um, the power budget, I do not remember exactly the details, uh, the number, because that is the work of the EPS subsystem. But we have did, uh, talked a lot about this and we finally figured out that the power from the sun and the power from the battery would be enough to run the, uh, the hyperspectral image compression on the FPGA. And also, we would want that no other process works at the same time because, again, this is a very power intensive process. So at that point of time, this is the only thing that happens. No downlink, no uplink, no uh, attitude control, only hyperspectral compression. Thank you. Marcos, you have to run. You're not a thrower, you're uh, a runner. So <laughs> I have a question about uh, the hyper um, <laughs> the, the hyper image um, thingy. Yeah, hyperspectral <laughs> image. Yeah. Um, uh, so you said it takes an image for every five nanometers. Yeah. Um, does it take all of those at the same time or no, um, no, sequentially? No, no, no. It, it depends on the model. So for the camera that we are using, it'll, it'll go Let's say you have a row of pixels this way. So the first row of pixels will be in one uh, spectrum. The next row of pixels will be in the next spectrum, and so on and so forth. And then you keep on shifting the frame downward so that in the end, every row of pixels is uh, available in every spectrum. So that is one of the ways to do it. There are a lot of other ways to do it. And um, yeah, that's it. Uh, okay, fine. So for a particular, let's say you have a 1,000 by 1,000 pixel frame. The first row, you get in, uh, let's say, in 400 nanometers. The second row, you take it in 405 nanometers, and so on till the end how at a particular time. How is the filter process? I mean, if it's sensitive to just that 5 nanometers. Okay, uh, we are not designing the camera by ourselves. We are acquiring it from somewhere else. However, for our simulations, we have designed a filter wheel. As in, it's a wheel with a diff uh, lot of different filters. And right now, for the PDR phase with uh, ISRO, we have to present them that, uh, we have to present some sort of a model. So in that case, we just have a wheel with a lot of filters, and the wheel rotates to get you uh, images in different filters as uh, time progresses. So it's a wide sensitivity image of the mechanical set of filters in front of it. Yeah. That's right. Hi. Um, Hi. You, you said you wanted to use the Z board. Um, yeah. You wanted to use it as it is, or you plan to build your own board? No, no, we can't use the Z board as it is because it's obviously bigger than one unit in size. Uh -huh. I guess you already know that. And um, we will be using a custom board, but the Z board is used right now for modeling. 
but the system on chip that we have on it, that will definitely be on board. And um, another question is, um, why have you selected this uh, multi-purpose system on chip instead of uh, an ordinary FPGA, so to speak? We wanted a system that, had, if we had just an FPGA, I would have to have another chip for uh, the, the processor, is that right? So this one has both of them together. Thank you. Thanks. More questions? Uh, okay. Hey, hello. So uh, ca can you please tell, uh, tell us a bit more about your hardware in the loop thing and uh, ha about testing? Yeah, okay. So the hardware loop simulation was uh, to test how the magnetic field model will be, since we have to model the magnetic field of the Earth's orbit right down here, we decided to use two Arduinos, uh, one of these Z board, and use MATLAB. So this is a whole loop. Basically, the idea is when you get uh, from a sensor, you get the magnetic field data, and then you run the B dot algorithm on your system. The B dot algorithm is, uh, it tells you how much to actuate your satellite based on the differentiation of the magnetic field. So uh, the first Arduino was simulating the magnetic field. Uh, we ran the orbit propagator model on the Arduino using MATLAB, as in the MATLAB gave values to the Arduino. The Arduino gave these magnetic field values to the Z board. On the Z board, we have the B dot algorithm running, and according to the B dot algorithm, the Z board will provide a value to the next Arduino, which will give you PWM signal, the pulse width modulated signals. And ultimately, even our actuators will, will run on pulse width modulated signals. So once you get PWM from the Arduino, more or less, you have simulated the magnetic field in Earth's orbit. Um, there will be more on this topic in IAF in Bremen, which is about a week from now. We have a paper over there as well. Very good. Um, I just have an additional question. Is, um, so I'm curious. Uh, you, most of the students, they have a mechanical electronics background. Or do you have, uh, I don't think it's an aerospace degree, is it? No, nope. we don't have an aerospace department as a matter of fact. So how do you get all this knowledge about actually, you know, the, the space part of it, of building a, a satellite? Um, so like I mentioned, we've already been through five years. It took us around four of those five years were in finding out how does a satellite actually work, as in a lot of my predecessors were only into reading papers and figuring out from scratch how to actually read, uh, how to actually build a satellite. And then of course, uh, we all go to conferences like this one where we learn so many things. And let's say my internship at the Indian Space Research Organization is where I learn a lot, a lot of other things. So yeah, just gathering from here and there, the internet is a huge resource. So and a lot of reading, I guess. A lot of reading. Yeah. <laughs> Which is actually good because this is what we model ourselves on as a research team. Mm -hmm. So we're getting there. Very good. OK, any uh, more feedback from the audience? Yes? Marcos, you have one? So uh, you mentioned the B dot uh, attitude control. Um, from that, what do you use for pointing the, the spacecraft? After uh, okay. the, the tumbling? Actuators. We have uh, we have a magnetometer, um, uh, sorry, a magnetorker, and we have reaction wheels. Okay. Yeah, the two of them. So it's going to be controlled in three axes. Yeah, reaction wheels along all three axes, <coughs> three of them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then, thanks, Tanuj, very much. So an Indian undergraduate student team building India's first hyperspectral imaging satellite in all open source. I think this should be something for the headlines. Do you agree? For newspaper? Yeah? Okay. Talking about headlines, newspapers.